Hello, so today I specifically wanted to address something um, that's actually very current in the news. You may have heard that uh, we have this thing now called coronavirus. So what I wanted to do is talk about not only A, how difficult it is to get reliable information, but how we have such vastly different conflicting sources and, and stories regarding where it came from, what it is, how it works. And I actually wanted to focus on one specific storyline probably the most extreme storyline, and that's the one provided by the documentary Plandemic. Um, by now, if you haven't seen it, you probably can see it because it's been banned from all social media sites. Uh, they've only, they only managed to ban it after it was viewed 8 million times. Given over, the documentary is given over by a lady named Judy Mikovits. And like I said, it's interesting because she's a PhD. Her doctorate is in virology, so she is a virologist. So, you know, if, if somebody were to tell you the only person that's reliable is your doctor. And, and basically, this is a person who is a doctor and her field of expertise is the thing that we're talking about, which is viruses. Um, so that's why, as, as you know, it, it's not going to be enough to, to beat this person out just by saying, well, she's not a doctor. In a, in a sense, she is a doctor. The other thing is, some of the things she says while on her face seem kind of crazy. I have to imagine that she was smart enough to get a doctorate, and I check, it's, it's legitimate, she's done research, she's published actual scientific papers, and so I'm not going to be convinced that she's just an idiot. Um, now, there are, a couple, there are a couple other videos that address her, her, um, her movie, um, but most of them are just dismissive. So you have, there are a couple MDs out there who just make videos saying, this is just a ridiculous, stupid uh, movie by her. You can't even be dumb enough to listen to it. You know, anyone who believes is an idiot. But I wanted to do something a little different. I want to actually assume maybe she's right. And I want to, I want to know, assuming that there is a truth um, out there, an objective truth, how difficult it would be to actually show whether or not her story holds water or is it possible or is it plausible. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people may believe in, in sort of conspiratorial thinking basically that the government is in on it they want us to have coronavirus so that we'll be forced to have to all buy um, a vaccine and somebody's gonna make a lot of money and big farmers in on it they don't want to cure everybody it's that type of that type of thinking corruption of government corruption of big pharma corruption of doctors um, and this is a this is a person who's articulate who's intelligent who's giving over this message it went like I said it went over to millions of people the, the, the ramifications if people listen to it are detrimental directly to their health. She speaks out against the vaccines. So before I walk out and just say, okay, that, you know, disregard and don't listen, I wanted to try to actually see, A, if, if, if given enough time and if you were to put in effort, can we get to the bottom line? So that was what I tried to do. And, and hopefully I would have done a good enough job that you don't, you won't have to read everything that I've read and you could just, I want to just give you the infos to make it more, once you have the information, you could draw your own rational conclusion. Um, so one of the things that makes it such an awesome story is that there is a paper trail. She's written two full books. The first one published in 2014 is called Plague, One Scientist's Intrepid Search for the Truth About Human Retroviruses and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Autism and Other Diseases. Number two. Plague of Corruption, Restoring Faith in the Promise of Science. Okay, and this one has a forward by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And then it says Children's Health Defense. That sounds like a very nice thing. I don't know what it is. Okay, so this one was published actually in 2020, but there's nothing in here that addresses coronavirus. That's all the whole movie that, that's pandemic. Um, and, and maybe I'll be able to show clips of it. That's all about by extension, the corruption of coronavirus. And then, lastly, there's just a stack of scientific articles that's available, many of which she authored herself. So I have many sources of her own words that I could see her trend of thought, see how it's changed over time, see what her work was in, what she did. Was there an actual point where she loses her sanity? Or, or, does, she, or does her story make sense? And, and looking into it deeper, Maybe I can find some something of a conspiracy. So that's that's my goal for what I'm trying to do here. Um, so Judy Mikovits, let me see. Let me begin. She she 
trained in the National Cancer Institute. She had, um, she got, like I said, she got, she earned her PhD and she specifically specialized in retroviruses. Um, so there, there are a couple different types of viruses. Some viruses, a little bit of science here. Some viruses ha ha um, contain a piece of DNA that's surrounded by um, a capsule or an envelope. Some viruses have a piece of RNA. And if you're an RNA virus, sometimes that RNA is a retro, sometimes it's a, you're, you'll be a retrovirus. So hold on, let me explain the big details. Let me just go over biology 101, just to get everyone up to speed. At we people, all organisms, we are all made up of cells. It, it's sort of, a, it's, it's the, the analogy I would use is like a castle would be made up of bricks. Um, we are made up of cells that, that, that are organized in a certain way to account for our bodies. And each cell has the blueprints of what it needs to do its job and to make another cell exactly like itself. That's the DNA. And the DNA is contained within the nucleus of the cell. And what happens to this DNA is it gets copied, like a carbon copy, into something called RNA. The RNA is transferred out, transported out of the nucleus, and that is translated into a new language, and that's the protein language. And proteins are like the actual troops. They do the jobs. So a virus doesn't have the ability to replicate itself. It has, its, it has DNA, but it doesn't have the ability to make its own proteins, and it doesn't have the ability to copy its DNA so that it can become children cells. So what a virus does is it, it lands on a cell and, it's, and a, t a virus is tiny compared to a cell. It penetrates the cell, it releases its DNA, RNA, whatever it is. So it, the coronavirus, for example, is an RNA virus. So the RNA normally, in the normal cell, that would be the copy of the DNA. Here it starts as RNA, goes into the cell, and the cell thinks it's just regular RNA and makes a protein out of it. But those proteins uh, are actually gonna be for the virus. So that's how the virus builds its capsule. That's how the virus will make a new new viruses and the RNA will be copied in this in the outside of the nucleus in the cell. Now what's so what's so interesting about a retrovirus is that it's RNA, but instead of just going in to make proteins, it it does this thing where it goes backwards and becomes it becomes DNA, and it's it, the DNA inserts itself into your DNA. So now your DNA will carry the virus's DNA in it. Every daughter cell that you have will have virus in it. And when it turns on, those um, those cells will make copies, like reg like it does with it's the rest of its DNA will make RNA out of those, and that will be make new viruses and also new viral proteins. Um, so that's the long and short of how a retrovirus works. Very famous retrovirus is HIV virus that causes AIDS. And what the other thing that's really really fascinating about retroviruses, and it's true of AIDS as well, is that because it inserts itself into your DNA. A, you can give it to your children. If it goes into your germ cells, like your sperm, those cells will carry it in them. Um, and B, because it's tinkering with your DNA, it has the ability to, to um, mess up your own DNA because it's just inserting itself in different places. So in, it, in that sense, it's like you getting a mutation. It can cause cancer. It can cause immune changes in people. So she was a retro a retrovirologist. And her where, where, where she really focused her attention was studying chronic fatigue syndrome. That's her thing. She's not a coronavirus person. She's not an autism person. Her main research was in chronic fatigue syndrome. What's that? So severe fatigue, especially after doing a little bit of exertion, they're always really, really tired. They get, they get muscle, muscle aches and they get, um, they probably get sick a lot. They can't figure out what it is. The doctor can't figure out what it is. It is it in your head. So these types, these patients go on and on. They have a prolonged course. No one knows how to treat it. No one knows what it is. Maybe to send them to a therapist. It's hard to figure out. It could be very, very frustrating and debilitating. She made her big, big discovery when it came to chronic fatigue syndrome. And I want to explain what, she, what it is that she discovered because it was like groundbreaking. This is where she came out and she, she sort of came on top of her whole field. 2006, a guy named Robert Silverman, he, he's, a doc, you know, he's another researcher. He was working in the Cleveland Clinic, which is a very prestigious hospital slash research center. And he published a paper, it's called Identification of a Novel Gamma Retrovirus in Prostate Tumors, blah, blah, blah. So this is what he did. He looked at people that had prostate cancer in the, running in their families. He tested people's DNA, and he wanted to know if there's, so, if there's sort of clustering of mutations. So we could tell if people, if we look at those mutations, they, they have a higher chance of getting prostate cancer. 
And what he found was there's a mutation in a specific gene that, that happens to be more prevalent in people who get prostate cancer. It's called RNase. That's just the name of this protein and gene. And what he did was, he said like this, what does RNase usually do? The function of RNase is usually part of your immune system. And its job is usually to help clear out viruses, specifically RNA viruses. That's why it's called RNase. The ace is to destroy it. So people who are missing RNase, he, re he reasoned out, maybe they're more prone to getting viruses. And maybe it's the virus that helps to cause the prostate cancer. This was, this was his reasoning. Like I said, a retrovirus, it inserts itself in your DNA. Maybe it has something to do with the retrovirus. So what he did was he collected a bunch of samples of prostate tissue. And by the way, there's prostate pathologists or you're involved in the study that I recognize. This is my field of study. I'm a pathologist in, in prostate. So it's, that's pretty cool. He tested a bunch of prostate tissue samples and he discovered a new virus we didn't even know existed. And he called it XMRV, xenotropic mouse retrovirus virus. He made whatever, XMRV. And A, he discovered it. B, he cloned it. He was able to look at its DNA, um, map it, and make his own virus at, from that DNA. Because a, a virus basically, it's only the DNA and a little bit of a capsule. He was able, so, so once you do that, he basically knew the sequence so that if he wanted to test someone else for having the virus, now that he knows the sequence, he knows how to target it. So we know how to test other people for it. And what he found was, like I said, prostate cancer that runs in families tends to have not only this RNA um, mutation, they tend to have this viral infection. So he wanted to say that prostate cancer can be caused by viruses, specifically XMRV. Now, here's where Judy Mikovits pops in. Mikovits looks at this, like I said, she's into chronic fatigue syndrome, and she thinks to herself, okay, I've seen in chronic fatigue syndrome, people have problems with their RNAs. I wonder, I wonder if in my patients also, maybe they're also infected by this virus, and maybe all along, chronic fatigue syndrome is really an infection by a virus that we didn't know existed. I'm gonna invent a virus, I'm going to discover it in this disease, it would be the equivalent of discovering AIDS. She wanted to discover a whole new virus that's associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, which has been frustrating people, you know, for so many years and these patients have no hope. She was coming in and she had that answer. What she did was she met people, a guy named Harvey Whitmore. This is a very, very rich person. He's considered the JF or the, he's considered like the Kennedy family of Nevada. Um, and his daughter, he's, he's married to Annette Whitmore, their daughter had chronic fatigue syndrome. So it was right up their alley. They wanted to try to find a cure. So they, so they A, raised millions of dollars, and, and B, he had huge political connections, specifically with Harry Reid. This guy Reid, he was the Senate, Senate Majority Leader out of Nevada. Okay, so this, these are big players. And he raised tens of millions of dollars, and he opened up the Whitmore Institute. So they actually opened up a research institute. They made Mike Evitz director of the institute. So they handed her this thing. She's in charge of now of this monstrous thing. And um, they, they actually get an association with the University of Nevada. So now that's, they, they become affiliated and they're getting lots and lots of government funding. So he, he's getting big money behind it. And what Mike Evitz did here, she, um, collaborated with the Silverman guy. So she said, okay, you're the XMRV guy. Let's do a research study together. I'm going to pull in patients from chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm going, to, I'm going to pull them in. I'm going to work with you since you're the XMRV expert. And we're going to try to see if we can figure out if my patients have more XMRV in their blood or in some of their tissue. And we're going to see if we could find an association. And lo and behold, she did. She found that um, the majority, the vast majority of her patients that were chronic fatigue syndrome were also positive for XMRV virus. So this was a huge, um, this was a huge discovery. The next, this was published in October of 2009. And basically within days, she was on, she was New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you know, blogs are blowing up, the, the, um, all the advocacy groups are blowing up. She, she was about to go, it was like she was on her way to being like an award-winning researcher. Um, she, she was huge. 
And for the Whitmores, what they were going to do is they, they opened up another lab, a private entity. It was called VIP DX. So they're already on the way to, to inventing the diagnostic test to test for this virus. So she discovered a new virus, but not only was it, here's the, here's the kicker, not only was it present in the vast majority of people with chronic fatigue syndrome, they found it in a minority of regular people. So let's say five, let's say about two to three percent of normal controls that they use, basically random people's blood, two to three percent, they said, has this virus. That would, that would come out to the equivalent of somewhere between 10 and 20 million people in the United States alone. So what does that say? Now, according to the research we have, there is a virus floating out there. A, it can give you chronic fatigue syndrome, but B, it could also make you more susceptible to cancer. And there's maybe 20 million people affected by it. That's a lot of tests to sell. So now we're looking at a billion dollar finding for her and for Whitmore and for their, their company. And also the issue becomes, what do we do now for giving blood products? Every time somebody wants to donate blood, we got to check in for this new virus. So basically this is going to be a test that we have to give everybody. And there's health ramifications for not just for a small selection of people who are sick, but this becomes like a national or international health issue that she's going to be at the forefront of she's on her way to stardom she's going to be superstar she's going to make she, she and her company they're going to make billions of dollars they're going to save the world they're going to save all these people from the, the chronic fatigue syndrome advocacy groups and all that now she's she's already going out she's already going off on doing tv interviews and here is where she first starts to trickle into trouble because she starts to speculate hey if chronic fatigue syndrome um ha is caused by a virus Maybe if the virus is also related to autism. And maybe, maybe if autism has a retrovirus, maybe that retrovirus is activated by a vaccine. So she starts to speculate and to speculate openly. I don't know if she's naive or I don't know if she's looking, you know, it, maybe she doesn't know what she's doing. Maybe she's not used to speaking in public, but this is, she, she's already, she could stir up a panic. That's, that's sort of, if you're not, if you're not smart and how you, how you speak, if you start speculating on things you have no, you have done zero research and that's a little bit, uh, that's that's where you start to get into trouble. Now, as the months start rolling by, the next thing that's going to happen in any scientific community is everyone's going to try to replicate her findings. So she has the first one. She's the big shot. But now a bunch of other labs are going to start doing, they're going to read her study and say, okay, well, I wonder if it really worked. Let's try to do it again. And unfortunately for her, a whole bunch of other studies start rolling out and they're going to be smaller and, and these are rush studies and they start having negative results. Her results are are for whatever reason mostly not being not being replicated, not being validated. Contamination of human DNA samples with mouse DNA can lead to false detections. People start, people start speculating, maybe something that she's using is contaminated with a virus. So she thinks she's detecting a virus in this blood sample, but in reality, the thing she's using to test for the virus has virus in it. That, that's, that's one possibility. She even writes a response, distribution of, of XMRV infection and chronic fatigue syndrome and prostate cancer. And within the abstract of this, she says, since 2009, seven, and, and she published her thing in 2009. Since then, seven studies um, have reported failure to detect XMRV. And she has a whole reaction and she has all her excuses built in. One, maybe they're, they didn't select the right patients because chronic fatigue syndrome is hard to figure out if, if they're, you know, how, how do you separate someone with chronic fatigue from someone with depression or someone with some other disease? It's, so, it's hard to select the right people. Or, or B, maybe maybe they didn't use the right, um, maybe maybe the testing they did wasn't sensitive enough. So she goes into a whole bunch of reasons why every one of those seven studies really doesn't disprove her, and she's hanging on for she's hanging on for dear life. And by the way, every single thing I've said so far comes out of her book. I got the story from her. I'm not using any other resource but her. If she refers to an article, I'll look up the article. Um, so this is not like I'm pulling pieces from that's going to contradict her. Um, so this article that I'm that I'm talking about, written by Treen, whatever. It's called Hope Outrunning Science on Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, right? So, Mikevitz has accused other researchers of bias and amped up efforts to sound the alarm over what she views as an epic health crisis. So, that's her stance. She thinks, okay, the scientific community is out to get me. There's seven studies done by seven doctors in seven different institutions. They're all wrong and they're all biased. And here's the part that really, really, I found fascinating and that's why I'm highlighting it. Quote, unquote. So... Research dollars will go for XMRV infected men with cancer, but not women with CFS. She wrote in an email. This left me no recourse, but to play the autism card. Will they ignore the children too? So 
I I found it disturbing. She knows how to weaponize these people. So she's like, okay, you're gonna do this. So I'll play that. And she really did this effectively. At this point, her le her her Whitmore Institute, they're already testing patients. So that people are sending them samples. They're charging them. They're testing them for this virus XMRV, and then. They're even advocating, they're telling people, why don't you treat yourself with antiretroviral therapy? So basically, what you would treat somebody with AIDS. They, people, people with chronic fatigue syndrome started taking antiretroviral treatment. They want, I want to treat my virus. And this is scary because, you know, at, at this point, the evidence is so minimal. It's just her study. Um, it's with, with all those conflicting studies. And there's side effects to these things. And she's saying, look, if that's what they want to do, I think they should do it. And she's out there just talking it up. The thing that comes up is that towards the end of 2010, she gets a study that comes in her support that's published by a couple guys who are associated with the NIH and the FDA. So it's even the government itself. It's called Detection of MLV Virus Related Virus Gene Sequences in Blood of Patients with Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. And and healthy blood donors. So just like her, they found this virus in people with chronic fatigue, but also in a minority of regular people to the, to the extent that 10 to 20 million Americans that don't know it are walking around with the virus. Now, what I was saying was interesting is at the same time, the CDC published their own study and they found the absence of evidence for this, for this weird virus in chronic fatigue and healthy control. So now two studies come out that exactly contradict one another and they come out from the biggest governmental research agencies that we have conflicting one another. So it's really, this is a story I've never seen in, in, in my experience as a doctor. It's, it's pretty fascinating in and of itself. Um, science, the, the, the journal Science is still following along. So they published a, a paper called Conflicting Papers on Hold as XMRV Frenzy Reaches New Heights. So this, this was pretty wild for people that were following the story. The negative study started piling up. So she clung to her study and she clung to the one study that supported her. She said, look, we have, there's one that supports me. That has to be what's going on. A guy called Francis Collins, he was the head of the NIH. He's a big, big dude. And, and, and he's working along, along with Fauci. This is where Fauci comes in. Because these are the heads of the NIH and the NIAD, whatever. So Fauci, we see him now all the time because he's, he's, they're always asking him what to do with coronavirus. He's, he was involved in this head on. What are we going to do with this new virus here? So they said, we got to get to the bottom of this. She doesn't stop. She says it's here. We have a bunch of studies that, says it, that say it's not here. Then we have this conflicting thing we have. We need to do the best study possible so that we could once and for all figure out does it exist in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or not. And to do that, they went to a guy named Ian Lipkin. Lipkin, he is a master virologist from Columbia University. They said, we need you to do this. And the strategy is we're going to use everybody involved. So Mikevitz is going to collaborate. We're going to use her. We're going to use her lab. We're going to use her samples. We're going to use her tests. She's going to, she's going to be involved in writing this paper because we need to, her to see for herself whether it's here or not. And we're going to do it her way. And we're going to do it not only with her, but also the, the people that did it with the FDA study and the people that did it um, with, the, with the, um, the National Cancer Institute, their study. They're all going to be in on it. We're going to get everyone together as one big fat collaboration. It's going to be a multi-million dollar project with all these huge institutions involved, and we're gonna to get to the bottom line, okay? Now, as I said, negative studies started rolling in, and this, the guy Coffin, he wrote an article alongside her study, basically saying, wow, this is an unbelievable discovery she made. He came out with a study himself and said, I figured out where this virus came from, and it's not infecting humans. I figured out that this virus is actually a mouse virus, and it stayed in the mice. But what happened was, a little bit complicated to explain. So um, researchers in general, they use mice to grow cells. So if I wanted to grow prostate cancer cells so I could test those cells, I need to grow them in something. I grow them through these mice. What happens is if you do that for multiple, multiple generations, the viruses that the mice have in them, maybe they can mutate in such a way that they could start to infect those cells. Okay. Now, the way he proved this was once you mapped, once he mapped the DNA of this virus, he was able to show that it was identical to part of the DNA of one virus and part of the DNA of another virus. If the DNA of the two viruses cut in certain places, cut and paste together, it's an exact duplicate. So he surmised that two viruses combined together 
and they became this other virus, and that virus was polluting prostate cancer cell line cells. It was all contamination is what I'm trying to say. And the way they proved it was they actually were able to go back to the samples from those mice, and it was in, it, it was in the mice up to a certain generation, and before that generation, it didn't exist. So that's how we know it came through that process. They proved it, they had it mapped out, they, they, they published a, a paper called Recombinant Origin of the Retrovirus XMRV, this is the guy Coffin from Tufts University. As far as he's concerned, the case is closed. We, we actually got the answer. It, never inf it, and it was never in any human subjects. You didn't get it from their blood. Once it's infecting mice and once it's infecting cell lines, now it's in the laboratories. It can just, these things are flowing all over the place because they're using cell lines to culture the viruses. When they're testing for the viruses, they're using these cell lines. So now, whatever they use, um, the, 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 the reagents they're using to do their testing, if they have even a little bit, because Mikevitz was using such sensitive tests because she wanted to amplify everything, her, if there's even one virus in there or a piece of the DNA, kaboom, she calls it a positive. So this is where things started to rapidly fall apart for her because like I said, she was on top of the world and now th there's stronger and stronger evidence that, that shows kaboom and the media jumped on it. So science published a big feature paper called False Positive. So it was all about how Mikevitz, she thought she had this thing, but she's totally messed up. And Mikevitz is stubbornly refusing to, to acknowledge it. I mentioned before about the advocacy. So I, I found an article, chronic fatigue syndrome researchers face death threats from militants. So a lot of people started, because she rallied up all the advocacy groups and even received death threats. There was, one woman said she would, they, someone told her that she would shoot them because they were take by them reporting negative studies, which, you know, the study is what it is, they felt that they were removing their only hope, their only hope for treatment. Like it's, an, like, like it's a direct threat to them being validated as having even a real disease. They, it seems from my reading of the book, if somebody were to suggest that chronic fatigue syndrome is psychosomatic, or a psychological thing. And by the way, psychiatric diseases are very, very serious. For them, they consider that as an insult. They consider that as someone telling them that it's not real, that it's all in your head. So that that was taken pretty seriously. Um, the blood study, the one that they put together to figure out how we're gonna deal with the blood banking of the whole country, comes out, Failure to confirm it's in the blood of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, multi-laboratory study. She's involved in the study. So she is an author in this study. That, and this is a huge negative, negative for her. None, the next thing that happens, a, a, um, a research student went to a conference and took pictures of the slideshow she was showing and figured out that she was using the same pictures and changing the labels of the pictures. So she showed a picture from her paper side by side with a picture from this um, from a slideshow she saw. And she showed how she was basically manipulating the um, the labeling of the picture to show she changed the sample names or she added she added something to make whatever to, to add virus to it or whatever. So this is a huge no, no in, in research because research works. It's, it's pretty much an honor system. Once. Once you're caught lying in research, it basically, we don't know, we can't trust anybody. How do we know anything in your paper is real? So this, this somebody who was, somebody, I, I don't know how they did this. They, they saw something and said, wow, that's crazy. They took a picture of it. Then they were blogging about it and someone on, the, and she didn't want to do it herself. So she gave it to her friend. The friend puts it in the blog and now it's in black and white. I have pictures of it and it's published. And again, science and nature. These are the, these are major scientific journals that are publishing and suggesting that her research is fraudulent. The way she's presenting her information is fraudulent. Okay, that happens. Now, there's another problem. As that big study came out, they were trying to sell the intellectual rights to the test they developed for this virus that was supposed to be making them billions of dollars. Okay, now once this is falling through, she said, we, can't, we shouldn't be doing this test. It came up to her. She got into a fight with her boss, Harvey Whitmore. Okay, um, they had already, by the way, tested hundreds of people. They had already made millions of dollars on a test for, for a virus that we've found out now doesn't exist. It's a contaminant from a mouse. And she gets fired by the Whitmores. 
Now, if she gets fired, the first thing she does is she picks up her phone, she calls her lab assistant and tells the guy, I need you to do me a favor, get in the lab and get all my notebooks. I need all my records. I don't know what she was thinking. She says that she wanted to protect the records because she thought the records were going to prove she was right. I don't even know what she's talking about. I don't know. That doesn't you know. Okay. Or she maybe she was thinking she wanted to continue doing her research because she wanted to keep the information. When the Whitmores found out about it, they felt that she was stealing their proprietary information. So they called the police and reported it. There was a warrant out for her arrest as a fugitive from the law. She's arrested and she's thrown in jail. So now she goes from a prestigious researcher to literally in jail. She's in jail for five days. Um, this was over Thanksgiving at the time. And she's a regular inmate. Um, she ends up having a civil lawsuit, which she loses in a matter of six weeks. So here's one place in her book where she really goes, goes to town because she feels, and, and, I, and by the way, she's probably right, that Whitmore is connected, the judge is in his pocket, the system is in his pocket, she's in his state, he throws her in jail, she can't get out no matter what. The, the judge, he basically found her guilty by default. She, she barely, I don't, I don't know what kind of case she made for herself or if she had an opportunity to make a case for herself, but it went down pretty, pretty badly for her. And as part of her defense, she ended up becoming pretty much bankrupt. Um, Ian Lipkin, who I mentioned before from Columbia, was actually calling Whitmore to please help her get, get her out of jail. So here's a researcher who goes to jail for trying to collect the notebooks. Um, now, what's interesting here is the story with the notebooks molds. It starts to, as you go from book one to book two to video, here in book one, she says, I told the guy to take notebooks. He took the notebooks. He gave me the notebooks. I had the notebooks, but then I couldn't find the notebooks. And then the police arrested me, and I and I couldn't. I didn't know where the notebooks were. But then we found them in my linen closet. By the time we get to this book, it was I didn't take the notebooks. They planted the notebooks so that they could arrest me in my house. You know. By the time you get to her video, Fauci took the notebook <laughs> because the government wanted me to go. It, it, the you can see how something ridiculous and probably traumatizing for her is for her going to jail turns from Whitmore doing it and her really having the notebooks or, or maybe misplacing them to it being done on purpose to her by him to it being done on purpose to her by the government. The, the story, her story to herself doesn't hold water. The other thing that comes, that comes interesting is that she's very defensive about the fact that she could not possibly have had a contaminant in her lab because she warned her lab assistants, no contaminations. But then she says that guy Silverman he, he did send some virus samples to us, even though I told him not to do it. My lab assistant did it anyway, and I have proof of it. So you're saying that you did have maybe some contamination. It's really, really not clear to me, but she's, the, it's, it, and, and this is at least in two or three different places in her books. So she does open herself up to that possibility, but she says it didn't happen, but it could have happened. But, and she's angry at the, her lab assistant that he let it happen, but it didn't happen. It's, it doesn't make sense. Um, three. As, 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 as a matter of her fraudulent images that she was showing in her journal, book one in the 400 pages here doesn't mention it, not once. Book two says, and by the way, they made me, they, they, they made it like I did a fraud and I never did a fraud. So it, it, the inconsistencies between the books and how they deal with the actual problems that she was involved with, A, she doesn't address any of them directly, or she does it piecemeal here and there, and they conflict with one another. I, I don't know what happened, but I'm not satisfied that I understand how this happened or what happened or what she knew and when she knew it or what her motivations were. Okay. Um, now, Silverman, who made the initial discovery in 2006, retracts his paper. He says, the discovery I made, I've seen the evidence now. I, I made a mistake. I'm picking my paper out of that journal. That paper with the RNAs and the prostate cancer never happened. Retraction. And... The papers that came out from the from the uh, FDA and the uh, National Cancer Institute retract the paper. Okay, that now is off the table. They acknowledge that it looks we've reviewed everything. It makes no sense that we have a positive and everybody else has a negative. We looked at our positives. We retested. It doesn't work. I guess we also made a boo boo. We have to retract our paper. Her paper is partially retracted. After Silverman retracted, they said, okay, since Silverman was involved with us, we can't rely on his data, so we're going to retract his part. But the rest of it has to be true. 
it became so ridiculous that sci the journal Science, in in a move that that I've never is unprecedented, retracted it without her approval because she wouldn't give the approval. She was so stubborn to admit that her finding was an error. She refused to do it. They can't leave fake information in a scientific journal because people are reading the journal. So they offered a forced retraction that they defended on the fact that most people in her lab wanted to retract the paper who were involved in this paper, but they couldn't agree to the language or they couldn't agree to do it. Basically, she wouldn't agree. So we just retracted it forcefully. Um, and so all this information now, basically the, the, the two or three or four studies that said there's this thing called XMRV and that it causes chronic fatigue syndrome, it's like, an, it's erased. So we thought we had something, we disproved it, it's out. Um, by the time, by the time you get to, to 2013, 2014, in my estimation, there are over 20 negative studies that took place in multiple, multiple huge institutions over probably seven different countries. There's studies in Europe, there's studies in Asia, there's studies in, you know, I saw studies in Latvia, I saw studies in Japan. I saw, basically, this, this was tested the world over because these, these papers are ripe to be published. Um, and when you have study after study after study saying we studied, we tested for this, we did it this way, we have no evidence that, that it exists. And at the same time, we have studies coming out yeah, we found that it does contaminate. We found that it spreads in the air. We found that if you put it in a lab, it could spread to anything else in the lab. We're finding more and more evidence that this thing is like the ultimate contamination. One question I can't figure out is with contaminations, usually things get contaminated equally. So um, if you have 50 samples that have chronic fatigue syndrome and 50 samples that are from normal people, and you're telling me that the positives are coming from contamination, both samples should be equally contaminated. I don't know how she got only, only contamination in this one and not that one. What it suggests to me, and I'm not the only one, is that the whole thing was fraudulent. I don't know for sure. Um, she's not the only one that had this problem, but I already know that she fabricated some of her images, and I know that she never ever really was willing to retract her paper or acknowledge the overwhelming evidence that existed in the world. So I, I don't know, just leaving that out there. Now, there's only one paper left that, that, that's sitting out in the world, and that was the Fauci-led, the NIH-led from Francis Collins study that was going to be the once and for all big kicker. This study, this came out in 2012, and she is the second author on the study. She wrote the paper. Basically, she's an author of this paper, and the paper says there is no evidence of XMRV being in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. The $2.3 million study led by Ian Lipkin of Columbia, funded by the NIH, was the definitive answer, Mikevich said in a press conference. The rigorous study looked for XMRV in blinded blood samples from nearly 300 people, half of whom had the disease and none had the virus. Open quote, there is no evidence that XMRV is a human pathogen, close quote, Mikevich conceded. This is a Mikevich quote, okay? Now, if you read through her material, she has not acknowledged this. Um, she says that it does exist. She says that this is all, um, especially in this book, the second one, that the government doesn't want to acknowledge it because once, because the government is going to be liable for all the people that are getting sick from giving blood to one another. Even though I don't see how that makes any sense, you can't be held liable for a disease we didn't know existed before. But she claims that it does exist, but the government is shutting her down. The medical establishment is shutting her down. The science journals are shutting her down. Now, the only thing I'll say for her defense is some of the science journals treated her harshly, but you, she put herself out there. When she was arrested, famously, the journal Science, one of, one of the writers, went out to the jail and took her mugshot and put it in the journal Science, which is kind of crazy. So that, that, you know, she felt like they, I could understand that she was upset at them. I could understand that she was upset at the Whitmores because they threw her in jail. I could upset that she was. I could understand that she was upset at the system, and maybe even that she was upset at other scholars for not defending her freedom. You know, her scholarly freedom. How can you let me go to jail? Or whatever she was thinking. But the rest of what she says is based upon her own material is illogical. Um, it's self-contradictory. The other thing that that's interesting is that when she was doing this study, that Fauci was sort of headlining. She had. They were doing a lot of the study at the National Cancer Institute. 
Fauci, she says, made a rule that she can't step on the property of the NCI or else she'll be escorted by security off. She says that Fauci didn't allow her to go into the lab where they were doing some of the tests. And that's because they wanted to cheat the tests and they, they, were, they were biasing it against her. Now, A, I can understand if Fauci, I mean, after she got fired and after she was considered a fraud, I could understand that why he wouldn't want her stepping on, you know, such a controversial figure walking into his laboratories. But, but B, he, he did deny that ever happened. I don't know. I don't know if it's true or not. And I don't think it's of any consequence, really, either way. Um, another thing that, that came out that's very interesting. About a year later, Harvey Whitmore, the guy who's going after her, he got himself in trouble because he was giving, he got in trouble for can, um, campaign finance violations. He was giving Harry Reid too much money illegally by, you're only allowed as a person to give a, um, a guy running for office, you're only allowed to give a certain amount of money. So what do you do? I give all my employees money to give him and I give my sister money to give him and I give all my, you find ways of funneling him money. And this way, by giving him so much money, he's gonna owe you stuff. That's the idea. He got caught. He was convicted and he was put in jail. So Mikevich says, you see, this guy, he, I told you he's no good. And now he goes to jail. Number two, the judge, it turns out, had accepted money from him, which is not illegal. It's just very, very poor form, at least not in Nevada. But he ended up recusing himself from the case after she was already, I mean, this was months later. So all I'm saying is a lot of the stuff that happened to her is very unfortunate. And she did get screwed, like really. But it has no bearing on the health system. It's, this is the way, I, that's why I wonder if, if a lot of the stuff was generally traumatizing to her. And here's where things get really, really crazy. And that's entering the current, the Corona and her current video. So in this video, which has the, you know, it has the dramatic music and it p tries to paint her as a world-class researcher who changed diseases and all that. Um, and so it tries to lend her credibility. She comes out and tries to, her, she tries to argue that Coronavirus is a thing that was manipulated um, in laboratory in, in the laboratory by big governments, um, including she names Dr. Anthony Fauci, who, according to her, even even previously is responsible for killing millions of people. Um, she says that it's all about big government wanting to force everybody else to have to use this vaccine that they would have patented. Um, so of course, pat patent, patents in themselves are part of the problem because now they they stand to make billions of dollars because we're going to be forced to have to take the vaccine because of the corona that they created, and then the vaccine itself is going to kill millions of more people. And as an example, she points out Bill Gates, who she says, "Who is he? How is he qualified to be trying to tell people what to take and how to do it?" Um, they actually at one point make fun of Dr. Fauci for wanting to have a double blind, a double blinded study, proper study of hydroxychloroquine. She claims that the, the medication is being purposely withheld from, um, from people. And she says the same thing happened with autism, which is pretty amazing. She, she, like I said, she hasn't published even one study about autism, but yet she, you know, she claimed that she knew how to treat it and that they wouldn't give the treatment. Um, so all in all, um, like I said, for her, the coronavirus, which that too, she has no direct experience with or research in or expertise in, is a purposeful conspiracy by the big, either big pharma, government, Dr. Fauci, they're all in on it. They want us to have it so that we have to buy the vaccine that they patented so that they make a lot of money. It's all, and it all ends up being about money. And all these forces were all against her all along, which is why they threw her in jail and they shut down her research and they wouldn't let her speak and they took away her constitutional rights and blah, blah, blah. That's, that's all of her things. Now, the most amazing thing I have to say about all this is how much she differs from herself because by only focusing on her work, reading her papers, her books, it, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. It's not a consistent story. Here, she tried, she tries to argue that, you know, the government threw her in jail or that Fauci threw her in jail when really it's very obvious that she got into an argument with her boss. She stole some notebooks, allegedly, and that was the dispute. That's all the dispute was. Um, there was the same, the, the same researchers that tried to help her out in that scenario. Um, 
The other thing that I find really fascinating is that she shows a complete lack of self-awareness and she, and she doesn't appreciate the irony all along that, first of all, she received her training in a government laboratory, her PhD, her doctorate, her, every accomplishment she has was all published in scientific journals. Any credibility she wants to gain from that professional training, she erases in everybody else by saying, oh, they're all in on it. So why should I listen to her? She's eliminated by her logic. That's worthless. So we could throw that away. Um, secondly, she's the one who got into bed with a guy named Harvey Whitmore, who, like I said, he, he's like the Kennedy of Nevada. She's the one who re who, who's, who's uh, having cocktail parties with Harry Reid, you know, having, having hangouts with him, raising millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars from government. She's the one who was invested in a company that had a patent for a test for a virus that didn't exist, that made millions of dollars off innocent people who thought they were being tested for a virus, like I said, that doesn't exist. She was the one who, who stood to make billions. It's so, the irony is so thick because every single thing she accuses somebody else of doing, she's the one who did. She's the one who was telling people, yeah, just go take antiretroviral therapy, even though she's not a medical doctor, she has no idea how to treat anything. And she's telling people to take pretty serious therapy for again, for a virus that doesn't exist. She's talking about autism when she has absolutely no medical experience or training when it comes to autism. She didn't do research in autism. Like I said, her main research was in chronic fatigue syndrome and all that went down the tubes for one, for strictly one reason and one reason only because the data said that it wasn't there. Um, and, and this was done by people who at first were with her who had to retract their own papers. So it's not like there was any, there was no incentive for them to do it other than the fact that it wasn't there and it didn't work. At no point did the government shut her down. Um, Fauci, she claims, didn't let her walk into his territory laboratories during that final study. He, he, in which case, you know, I, I actually don't blame him if that's true. I don't, I don't know. But that, that's the extent of it. I, I, I don't see any evidence for any, not one other claim that she says. I don't see any evidence that vaccines are killing millions of people from anything that she's written. Um, and, and furthermore, I actually have a hard time deciding whether, whether she's actually crazy, whether she's cuckoo, whether it's intentional, whether she's actually just making money by selling books, by saying crazy stuff, or it's possible that she went through something that was really, really traumatizing and that she, perhaps she really believes what she's trying to say, which may, which may make her less intentionally evil, but even more dangerous because she'll be even more convincing. Um, the other thing that's amazing is that she's the one who manipulated her data and she's the one who had contaminants in her lab that manipulated her results. Whereas she, could, she and, and she's the one accusing the, the, the laboratories now of having manipulated some stuff into a new virus that they created. So every, almost every single thing that she accused everyone doing in the video, it seems to me she's actually guilty of herself, which is, is a very diabolical type of thing. I, 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 it's actually kind of having read everything and then watching the video, this video becomes all the more disturbing. But now that I've given you all, all, all these resources, you have them. Um, for my taste, I would say she has, for me now, zero credibility. And I got to go even further. For someone to put their name on this book, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., zero credibility. So he, you have to understand, he's also highly influential, multi, authored of multiple books, some, some national bestsellers. He's, he was a, a, a successful lawyer. These are intelligent people. But you can see the power of somebody that has an agenda, of somebody involved, whatever that agenda is. It could even be a good agenda, but they are incapable of giving you unbiased, objective data or, or results. They are not attached to reality. At this point, they are trying to win in, in, in some kind of battle, whether it's revenge or whether she's angry or whether she wants to get her career back. Another interesting point is that everybody else who had to retract their information moved on. You know, she could not come to terms with the fact that the, the glory she thought she had was all an error. And so she can never admit it. And therefore it seems that she will say whatever she has to say for her alternate reality to remain intact. And if that means that governments are in it, if that means there are 10 countries, they're all in on it, 
and all the libraries are in on it, and Ian Lipkin's in on it, and Dr. Kaufman's in on it, and Dr. Silverman's in on it. She literally puts all these people in on it. At the end of the day, in her books, not one doctor that she's worked with comes out except one guy that trained her, Frank Rossetti, and he's pretty quiet. You don't see one person on the internet supporting her. Um, the silence is actually, from her field, is, is quite telling. Um, the other thing she does pretty easily is throw everybody else in, in the lab under the bus. So it's her lab technician's fault. And this one caused the contamination. She doesn't take responsibility for anything. According to her, she's, she, discovered, she discovered the next AIDS epidemic and the government shut her down. And now she's gone on the attack in terms of Corona, even though I don't see any actual proof of anything here. And I didn't look at every single allegation she made, but I don't need to because I've already eliminated this person's credibility. So if she wants to make all sorts of predictions, even if one of them turns out to be true, you know, it's, it's, it's irrelevant to me. I am not saying that medicine is perfect. I'm not saying the government's perfect. I'm not saying patents are perfect. I'm not saying any of those things because like I've said, she, in, in some ways, maybe she did get screwed here or there, but not what she says is so outrageous and so far removed from the truth, it, it, it's ridiculous. And I'm saying this as, as somebody from the perspective who's reviewed her, all the complete body of her work, and I've been through it two or three times at least, all of it. Um, so I could say this with absolute confidence. And so there's probably a greater likelihood of aliens flying in tomorrow than of what she's saying being true. And that is to say that if it's possible, it's so, it's so, the possibility is so minute as to be irrelevant. And uh, if you've made it this far, I, I appreciate it. You could give me any comments you have, any feedback. You tell me what you want me to do. And uh, we'll move on to the next item. All right. Thank you.